What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Gold Jr. That is me. With me, as always, Super Producer Brandon Newman. Brandon, how we doing? Doing great, Mike. How are you this Monday morning? Uh, I am good. Uh, not with us, as always, my father, Mike Golick Sr., load management again, a.k.a. he is playing Greg Olson's golf tournament uh, in South Carolina, which is awesome. Obviously, nice. Greg is someone who supports a lot of great causes, and so glad Dad is being the liaison for the show on that front. He'll be back here tomorrow to get his takes off. We got a great show today. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review. Leave us a five-star rating. Check us out on the DraftKings YouTube channel as well as DraftKingsNetwork.com. Plenty to get to. Awesome fight action over the weekend. Awesome golf action over the weekend that we got to get around to. Some interesting comments from Adam Silver from last week that we also didn't get a chance to talk about really. But uh, Brandon, tonight is nerve-wracking and not in the same way that it's nerve-wracking for our friends at the Lebitard show who are the Miami Heat Nation that are very worried about this nerve-wracking for all of us because this might be the last night of basketball that we get for the 2022-23 NBA season we got game five back home in Denver I am feeling very vindicated right now as someone who at the beginning of this series said Denver in five and felt pretty good about it mostly because my dad picked Denver in six which is I think what I wanted to go with and I just decided to knock game off for bravado and it's worked um and so I am excited to be right it's the most potent drug in sports media when somehow every so often lightning strikes and we get to be right about something and feeling really good but I'm also kind of sad about that because Monday June 12th to now be done with basketball and to have to go and live in the void is a little bit sooner than we all want to get there so I I wouldn't be mad if the Miami Heat pulled this out, but Brandon, I just don't think it's going to happen at this point. I think we have got a team that did good, tried hard, but now it's time to go back to the student section because they ran into bigger, faster, stronger, better that has just leaned on them until they have passed out. And I think we're going to see a mature team in Denver who realizes they don't want to give this Miami team any life. You saw what can happen when that goes on on the other side last series between them and the Boston Celtics and Denver's probably just going to handle business and get this thing done with. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mike. I'm so sad to hear that you sound like sheep right now. You're also like accepting defeat. I guess you're trying to be right with your take of Denver and five, but you're accepting defeat thinking that basketball is going to end uh, tonight uh, with, with the Miami Heat losing. I don't think that's the case at all. Obviously, I have Miami Heat in seven, and I'm glad Pride pushed you to a more correct take of, of Denver and five when your dad had Denver in six. Well, Pride led me to have Miami Heat and seven because I could not be on the same side of you guys as, as no matter how big or faster or stronger that the Denver Nuggets appear to be even with Christian Brown on their roster. But I, I, I feel like we are going to see Eric Spolstra do something special again tonight just to extend the series for basketball fans. I don't think that Miami can win three in a row which they would have to now to uh, get this to a game seven which is my original pick but come on they played an altitude before. They can get a win tonight. <laughs> By the way, you all just got a window into Brandon's soul for how most of his opinions come to light on this show is, oh, this is what you guys think? I can't possibly agree with you. <laughs> it's going to lead to maybe the most ludicrous Brandon take we've heard on here in a while because Brandon's staring at the cliff of this series and what's going on, right? We go all the way back. We didn't get to talk after game four of this series when – Miami couldn't get over in the one best last opportunity I think they had. Nikola Jokic foul trouble late in the game. Jokic mm. had to go off the floor with five fouls at a critical juncture. The Heat were down 10. He came back into the game about uh, however many minutes later, and the Heat were only down nine. Like, they were not able to put a dent in the side of this because... Shaq's the others came into play, right? Aaron Gordon, who to me, if you're looking for what this series is emblematic of, right? What happened yeah. in this series? Why is Denver ultimately going to lift the trophy? We've sort of worn ourselves down talking about the constant that is Nikola Jokic, which is sad. This is supposed to be his coronation moment. It will be when he's named finals MVP, but we're already 
looking around and this is what happens when you cover like a big championship event you spend so many time so much time with the storylines that you're constantly searching for that new hit of something that's going to feel original late in the game and right. it's probably that Aaron Gordon is emblematic of the Denver Nuggets success right they go back and acquire him last year he outperforms even their wildest expectations of what they could have done in critical moments and from the jump in this series he was the guy in game one hunting smaller matchups in Miami when they decided to go with their smaller lineup before they put Kevin Love on the floor Aaron Gordon would get matched up against Max Max Struess or Caleb Martin or Gabe Vincent and immediately it was head down going to the basket and mouse in the house and now in game four he comes out here and I think goes three or four from beyond the arc in this game was their leading scorer for Denver and does so because more often than not he is a physically imposing mismatch but also a streaky shooter kind of reminds Miami of themselves and so if they mm. were going to slack off someone it was going to be off him but he came through in a way that so far the Heat role players have done with I'd say mixed results right now every once in a while we've gotten some guys to step up a little bit but more often than not it's been Denver's got the most constant to rely on in Nikola Jokic the most potent version of that their co-star in Jamal Murray seems like he's also in ascension mode for his career and then the others are just too big too fast too strong for Denver and that's kind of led us to this point where you can only hold on like that for so long for Miami when your strengths are streaky three-point shooting team and great effort on the other side like the magic that you talk about that Spolster might pull out is playing zone again in some different spots like that was supposed to be their you know trump card in a lot of yeah. situations was well they're gonna muck it up they're gonna slow it down they're gonna play zone at certain opportune times and all of a sudden try and bring you down to their level they're a mutter football team right the way we always talk about with yeah. my dad where you can bring better athletes down to your level in a rain game and it's why a lot of guys like playing on a sloppy track that's what miami basketball has tried to do during the course of this nba postseason it's why Against all odds, as far as how we talk about this Denver Nuggets team, I firmly believe they are the more aesthetically pleasing basketball team to watch in this NBA Finals. Like, they're more inherently fun than Miami's style of basketball is, largely because Miami's style of basketball is we want to make the sport uglier so that we can have a better chance of winning. Not to dispute that there are skilled players on Miami, but overall, that's how they've got to win, Brandon, when they're the lesser talented side all of that leads to a point where you can only hold down turbo on the uh, video game controller for so long before yeah. your players got to catch their breath and unfortunately for Miami I think that's coming and the waning moments of this series yes I hear you and I, I think that Denver Nuggets are aesthetically more pleasing to the basketball eye but let's not forget the beer goggles that we have on from this playoffs like <laughs> <laughs> We're not dealing with the, uh, a highlight reel monster monster team in the Denver Nuggets. Like they are the monsters in the sense of them just being so much bigger than the Toon Squad Miami Heat. But they are not. Aaron Gordon plays more highlight driven highlight reel basketball that the NBA is used to promoting than Nikola uh, than Nikola Jokic does. I God, can't not mess his name up. Uh more than Jokic does. But we'd yeah. love to see it. I mean, you've seen I don't know if you remember playing me seeing me play basketball. I play like Jokic. You know, so I, I do feel some solace in, in seeing a big man score in such a, a wild, lazily and you don't want to leave me open either. But Mike, what I'm trying to say is there is more tools to be pulled out of the Toon Squad um, it's not necessarily Michael Jack, Michael Jordan's secret stuff because the Jimmy Butler, Michael Jordan connection, and we don't want to get into all that stuff right now. But Jimmy Butler is is not a hundred percent. He hasn't been a hundred percent because he's been so banged up or he's so fatigued from getting the Miami Heat to this point again, like in twenty twenty in the bubble season when my Lakers uh, hoisted the trophy at the end of it after beating the Denver Nuggets. But they don't have an answer for Jamal Murray. The the Heat doesn't the Heat they don't have an answer for Aaron Gordon they don't have an answer for Contavious Caldwell Pope when he gets in his foul trouble and, and can hit some threes so yes there's there is no answer on the floor for them but still I I, I refuse to believe that Game Two was such an anomaly that we won't see another Heat win in the series. I think it's just like vibes. That's the only thing people can point to for how Miami might pull this off is Eric Spolstra voodoo. 
because other than starting that, UD. Right, like, oh my God, <laughs> UD, who I think just turned forty-three yesterday or today, which five let's... fouls in the first quarter, do it. Oh, dear God, just go out there and have him absorb body blows. It, um, Brandon, it, it made it's made me think all of this being on the cusp of finishing up this series of what life would look like after, and I know this is a dangerous bit of putting the cart before the horse before they get the win. Michael Malone has been very sure, certain to get to the microphone and say, we haven't done anything yet and they're going to try and do it tonight. But it has made me wonder if this will change anything for the Denver Nuggets, right? Like it'll change things personally for Nikola Jokic, who has already two-time MVP in the regular season to his name, is going to add a finals MVP to his name if and when they win this thing, and will now be allowed inside more potent discussions around basketball. But I wonder for the Nuggets as a team, right? I went back and looked last year at the primetime games, so the ESPN, ABC, or TNT games that each team was a part of. Denver was 10th. They had 16 primetime games in this last season. The defending champion Golden State Warriors led the NBA with 30. They were followed by the Lakers at 20. And then Boston, the 76ers on after that. So I do wonder if this will be an opportunity for Adam Silver and company to all look up and say, all right, well, now they're the defending champions and maybe Denver's not the biggest TV market in the world. But now all of a sudden, this is an opportunity for us to get them in front of more eyeballs and see as Nikola Jokic now ascends and continues to break past that wall in his career can we start to introduce them to more people before you get to the finals? I don't want to move on from the NBA finals without getting to something wild that Brandon said on our call last night. So we get our crew together. We do a little production call every day and we kind of bat around some things that we might be interested in talking about here. And we started bringing up what I just mentioned about how would this Nuggets team see a bump in exposure next season based off of lifting the trophy, lifting the Larry O'Brien, having what most people look at after this postseason run as the best player in the world in Nikola Jokic, a team that I think is inherently more fun to watch than we give it credit for when we used to just shun Denver off to the side with the Jazz and with the Suns before Kevin Durant and say, no, we're, we're probably good on the four corner states basketball. And then it got to that point that got brought up on the Levitard show the other day, which was if Nikola Jokic was an American-born player instead of Serbian-born player or you know, international player in general, he would be much more popular and embraced by people. I, I, I don't think that's the case, especially if style of play is the same and our exposure to him off the basketball court is the same. Like You only have to look as far as a guy like Mike Trout in Major League Baseball, who is objectively one one of the best players to ever play the sport, but has no interest in playing the game outside of that, is a bit more of a private person, and thus we don't get your involvement for the NBA, in staying with this example, in the NBA offseason where we've got the will-they-won't-they of this star player forcing their way out in a way that Jokic has never done in Denver. Will they try and form a super team? Are they trying to press their front office to bring in another player from the outside? Is Kyrie Irving uh, putting out cryptic reports that he's called you in the offseason to see if you want to come to Dallas we don't get any of the mess with Denver and because of that and because Nikola Jokic isn't in a ton of national ads or dating celebrities we don't see as much of him outside in the way that usually begets NBA stardom and that led Brandon to a take that I don't know if he believes I don't know if this is again Brandon wanting to be a contrarian and just not agree with me on something but Brandon How did you phrase the idea that you believe coming off this NBA Finals, if Denver were to win, Christian Brown would actually become the face of this team for the Denver Nuggets? I did not say it that way, and thank you for misleading the audience. I said 1,000% Jokic's heritage and not being an American affects his marketability in the NBA, and that's Probably one of the reasons why they're the tenth most uh, primetime games uh, g- going into last season or after last season. But I am saying, after the va- validity of a NBA championship 
and all the players on that team. Let's not forget big baby Glenn Davis and Nate Robinson's uh, ascension to fame after they were on a Celtics uh, team and had a couple points during the series. I think Christian Brown, yes, that, that white man from Kansas, the middle of America, Mike, if I need to remind you, the middle of America is in Kansas. And he has a name, Christian, right? And he's representing minorities with the last name Brown. Uh, I think that he... I think the Denver Nuggets would love for him to be the new face of that franchise as Jokic, you know, has all of his accolades and, and all the things, but he's still a center uh, playing point guard. And uh, respect to Jamal Murray and how much he facilitates the offense, but I do feel like a, an American, uh, a red-blooded American, you know, you get you open up that, that, that Yeti and you say you made in America. It makes you feel a little different. I think America wants Christian Brown to be the face of the Denver Nuggets moving forward after Jokic has had his time he's tw he's 28 as as we as we as we know but I'm saying I'm saying they're going to push those two as the front just so that Jokic can fade away in the background and, and Christian Brown can can be right there front and center uh balling brown as he calls himself on Twitter yeah it's all right, the amount of laughter in that lets me know how seriously I need to take this take because the notion that Denver I... Nuggets fans who have wanted nothing more than for the rest of us to appreciate their incredible player as much as they appreciate their incredible player finally on the cusp of that happening would say, no, care, you know bro, what? Yeah. This guy who scored 15 points for us in one game in a way that surprised everyone, this is the guy that we want to push forward. Hey. Not the unicorn, not the seven-foot guy who passes like a much smaller player still scores at an incredible clip and moves in ways that even his body seems to want to resist no 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 we'll take christian brown please and he's thank too you. selfless i don't believe Jokic is too selfless and that's not what american sports sells you get, it's uh, all brandon, about the kobe mentality brandon i don't know if i need to strum guitar here tell you about another man uh from back in the day who was so selfless that he gave his life to save the rest of us Indiana Jones? <laughs> that too. But uh, no, I mean, listen, any argument you make about Jokic as a passer or being selfless is the same thing that people said about LeBron James long ago. We're past all that. We're in a golden <sighs> age of big players who have come to show us and reimagine in our head what is possible for seven-footers in the NBA, leading fast breaks, making post-ups somehow not only sexy, but according to J.J. Redick, efficient in a way that in general for the rest of the league, they are not. It's an incredible place that we have found ourselves with Nikola Jokic. And I just am curious because, again, I don't think it's that he is, you know, a not from America. I also think we're past that. We've seen plenty of players that have come from overseas that quite honestly are the better players in the NBA right now. We seem to do have a lack of American born stars at the top of the league. And yeah. But I do think that we've seen plenty come over and find success both as marketable stars, as people that draw interest to the NBA. It's just, again, what we tend to reward in the NBA is usually the mess. We tend to reward mm. when players hold out, when players turn free agency into what Kyrie has. I go back to Giannis Antetokounmpo. We were on the cusp of this with him. There was that stretch of time before he signed his extension with the Milwaukee Bucks where we started to wonder, and then they got that deal signed. Giannis wanted to get that out of the way so their focus could be winning a championship, and then it ended up becoming so because they were able to avoid what is the low-hanging fruit that we all want to reach for, which is if a star in this league is unhappy, what they can do and what they can make happen seems pretty limitless at this point. We've watched it happen with James Harden at multiple stops. We watched the latest Brooklyn Nets experiment with Kevin Durant, Kyrie, and him blow up famously. That's the stuff. That's the easy car accident stuff on the side of the road that we tend to be drawn to in the NBA. But because the Nuggets have been the poster of stability, we've rarely had reason to look at them other than the basketball. And until now, we've been able to shut them away because they haven't done the basketball part up until this level. And now that they break through this, you wonder if that'll finally be enough for everyone to look and say, we've got the best player in the league coming into the prime of his career. We should probably give people more of this in the name of promoting the actual basketball. And so with all that in mind, I told Brandon that if he actually believes now, I I should uh -uh. say this. I realize the stakes of this bet 
in no way put pressure on Brandon to believe what he's actually saying. But to prove my point and my confidence about how ludicrous this is, I told Brandon that if Christian Brown appears in a single advertisement that makes its way to my television or to my Twitter timeline after this NBA Finals championship appearance, I will Venmo him $500. Because I don't think we're... We have seen plenty of this all throughout this postseason, right? White role players have stepped up throughout this postseason in a way that's been a funny, like, weird thing through line through most of the NBA playoffs. We've seen this in the past with the Alex Caruso's of the world and it's fun for a few. And then they get traded somewhere else because that's what tends to happen with role players, especially now as we're getting towards this new CBA stuff. And it's going to be real interesting how people legislate that with the amount of money that's going to have to go towards stars and how little you're going to have to pay other people besides that. And so I am firmly confident in the fact that, well, I hope Christian Brown continues to develop. He's a young player in this league. This is not me rooting against Christian Brown. This is me pushing back on the ludicrous notion that Brandon wants to bring to the table. Mike, you're saying that I don't believe it, and you're trying to act like I'm I'm being funny to, to lessen it. I cannot wait for this $500 to hit my bank account. Just to fantasize about what possibly is going to happen. Obviously, Amazon's winning the, the shipping wars, but UPS, what can Brown do for you? Needs to make a strong comeback after Denver Nuggets, this little franchise, comes out of nowhere and wins a championship. Might as well take the guy who had one point and one rebound in, in game four and uh, make, <laughs> make him the face of their franchise him and some him and some little brown shorts that that's a commercial right there not to give I, anybody I, ideas. listen i i would just say no not that we're giving away free game game <laughs> here but yes i was among the many people i saw me and nikias duncan who was on this podcast last week both within 45 seconds begrudgingly barf onto the internet what can brown do for you spelled b-a-r-u-n because you can't not and so yes that should happen but I don't believe it will happen. So we'll wait and see. That's the stakes of the game right now. That is all what hangs in the balance as we potentially wave goodbye to basketball tonight. Um, Nine-point favorites, Mike. Denver Nuggets are nine-point favorites, and I'm saying Hamber, Hamber. Hamber. (laughs) Hammer the under? You mean Hamber the Miami Heat plus nine and a half. Yes, Hamber, Hamber, the Miami Heat, nine, nine plus and a half. All your gambling analysis live here on Gojo. Hamber the hell out of that one here. We're going to have to build out one final parlay. Me and Dad pissed down our legs in this last one. You're Woo. the only one carrying the weight in this entire thing as I make fun of your NBA takes here. If we're going to put together, the only thing I can tell you is we put together this one. And since Dad's not here, we're going to have to do this post show and get it to you guys operating by the honor system here. I'm going yes. Denver Nuggets money line. Like I am, I am putting really? my money where my mouth is on the game tonight. I am operating and gambling along with the prediction that I see coming to fruition here. And I do think the Denver Nuggets close this thing out tonight. And I do think that we have to wade into the great unknown. So we will okay. sort that out post show today. In the meantime, Brandon, I wanted to get to one other thing that came up at the end of last week that we didn't get to talk about. I think it was Thursday or Friday, uh, Adam Silver, the NBA commissioner, went on the Dan Patrick show. And in the wake of all the live news that we talked about last week, that was a subject that got brought up before Adam Silver. And I thought his answer, combined with some NBA news that did not get enough coverage going back to last year, all creates a real interesting set of circumstances that people need to prepare themselves for. This was the sound of Adam Silver when asked about the Saudi PIF, the uh, the fund involvement in live golf and in sports in general. Golf, just like basketball, is extremely global. I hear what people are saying about Saudi Arabia. On the other hand, and this is for you know good and bad, when the Saudis invest in sports, it gets outsized attention. Now, I don't want to complain about that because we want to get outsized attention. On the other hand, somebody could go down the list there. They are investors in some of our largest American corporations. Um, Some of the most well-known brands have investments from them. And I also think it's a a two-edged sword. I I hear the comments about sport washing. On the other hand, um, you're talking about it. Others are talking about it. It's not as if some errant golfer can say one thing about his reaction to Saudi Arabia investing in golf, and that's left at that. I think people are pretty sophisticated. 
So Adam Silver went on to say that he thinks it's a two-edged sword. And he hears the complaints, and like he said, um, it's a. He said, "I think people learn about these countries, learn about what's happening in the world in ways they otherwise wouldn't. So the media does its job." Now, I think there's a big difference between the media going and telling the stories of the human rights violations of these countries and accepting millions of dollars from them and allowing a tacit partnership between these groups. And the key part to me is Adam Silver went on to say the NBA were such a global sport. I think people are a little too dismissive these days about the benefits that come from commonality around sports that with a sport like basketball, our finals are distributed virtually everywhere in the world. The sport is played everywhere in the world. It's an opportunity to bring people together. Brandon, that man did his best Silk Sonic impression because that is the sound of Adam Silver leaving the door open. Like in the wake of Jay Monahan <laughs> being held up in front of the congregation as a massive hypocrite for invoking 9-11 families and then coming back to take this uh, PIF money, Adam Silver looked at this situation and said, I see where these roads are going and I am not going to have myself look the fool here. He came out here. He sat right directly on the fence posts and both sides the hell out of this, out of this idea. And then basically left the door open for this Saudi money to make its way into the NBA. And Brandon, lest you think I'm crazy about a year ago, the NBA changed its rules to allow different funds and endowments to buy their way into NBA teams. Now, they could only buy minority stakes. No fund can own more than 20% of an NBA team, but they created space specifically so that things like university funds, pension funds, but also sovereign wealth funds like PIF with the Saudis can have a place in investing in an ever-growing NBA where maybe anybody, everybody doesn't have the money to buy the entirety of a team. They wanted to create space as valuations for these NBA teams keep going up for more people to get money on the table and have created the perfect space for the Saudi PIF fund to do exactly what it, well, I realize PIF fund is redundant, to do exactly what they did with the PGA, which is get some influence and some space in this, but not necessarily have to be the face. And so I just want people to prepare in their brain for when this happens. Cause I don't think it's going to be an if Brandon, I think it's going to be a when now there's still control. The NBA owners and the board of governors would still have to approve all of this stuff. But this is the reminder that the NBA is a lot like every other league and every other business. They really like money. And even though they get the credit for being a more progressive league, and I believe Adam Silver really cares about the players, he also works for 30 guys that care a lot about the money that this whole thing makes. And they see this as a green opportunity, which is why at a very critical juncture, the commissioner of the NBA came out and basically said, I think we can use basketball to bring people together. His way of saying, when this happens, this is going to be our line and I am going to be consistent with it from start to finish. Well, he also, he didn't just sit on the fence, Mike. He pointed at everyone on the other side of the fence that has been getting Saudi money this entire time that apparently Americans don't even know about. Like, I, after hearing his, his comments on Dan Patrick, I just Googled Saudi investment money in U.S. companies, and the Saudi Arabia uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund has money funding Amazon, Google, Visa, Microsoft, Disney, Nintendo, Uber, PayPal, and Zoom. The fact that these are all companies that the majority of us use five of these companies a day and we think nothing about the Saudi money that, that's funding it. I think that's where Adam Silver is kind of really pointing at is like, guys, like you can do your research and, and, and find reasons to say why the NBA is bad for possibly taking these money or leaving the door open to do so and why uh, professional golf is bad for, for uh, blending with this company. But how you get your packages is also uh, laced in this as well, which I, I thought was a little bit more of him trying to normalize it versus him sitting on the fence. 
Well, and I guess that's exactly why the public investment fund for Saudi Arabia is doing what it's doing. Exactly what you said. They want this to become something that people just shrug their shoulders at. Phil Mickelson made that really hard by giving up the game on the front end of the entire yeah. live experiment. And for the Saudis, they were the face of live golf, right? Now they're the face of that. When it, they took over Newcastle United in the Premier League, when they bought a team there, they took over and were the face of it with how much they owned, but by all accounts and all reporting have tried to fade more into the background as far as their day-to-day -day involvement. I don't think they want to be the face of any of this. They just want that bit of influence and for what you said to become true. Well, their money is everywhere, so we're just going to shrug our shoulders and pay less and less attention to any of the human rights violations that do make their way into the news stories reported and things like that. So just it, it, it struck me as interesting. And then going back and looking at seeing that the NBA literally a year before this had changed to allow for groups exactly like this to buy their way into small portions of NBA franchise seems all like it's an indicator of which way the wind's blowing as that Saudi investment fund just continues to rack up more and more assets to their names. I do think it's important that he mentioned that they have not yet inquired about purchasing an NBA team, which is, you know, I don't know if that's... Oh, I, listen, I believe him on that front, but we just see, uh, and we talked about this off air, that groups of rich people together never tend to be satisfied with how much money they've got. There's always mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, the disease of more. And I think with a Saudi investment fund that has continued to stack assets and has seen success in the way they've operated so far, they're not just going to be satisfied with a little bit. They're going to keep going. And so this seems like one of the logical next places for that to happen. Um, a bit of an interesting and somewhat morbid note in the finals, but this is the reality of the world that we're living in right now. Brandon, let's try and get to something a little bit more enjoyable around here as we had a big wide west rest of the weekend in the world of sports and get to weekend roses, uh, bachelor bachelorette style. You and I give out roses to deserving winners from over the weekend uh, at Gojo Show on Twitter if we missed any or someone that you wanted to celebrate. But Brandon, I wanted to start this off the RBC Canadian Open this weekend finished with an absolute flaming blaze of glory here. I turned on this tournament, thankfully, in the second hole of the playoff. So this tournament went to a playoff. The RBC is Canadian, Canada's National Open. You know, very important to everybody and our friends north of the border here. And Nick Taylor, local guy, Canadian-born player, was going up against Tommy Fleetwood in the, in the playoff that ended up going through four holes. It was electric. Tommy Fleetwood shanking balls into the stands. They're trying to take this thing down to the wire, and it ends. And it's why my rose will be going to Nick Taylor. Nick Taylor hit a walk-off 72-foot putt for Eagle to ice this thing and give Canada its first Canadian-born winner of their Open in 69 years. Whew. All of that put together was incredible theater. And then on top of it, you threw in the fact that his buddy Adam Hadwin, another Canadian-born player, came on the green to celebrate with him at the very end and was promptly annihilated by a security guard on the green who didn't recognize him. And Adam Hadwin was in street clothes at that point. He's like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, a buck 80. So he just looks like a civilian. And the security guard gave him the form tackle of a lifetime on the green there while he was trying to celebrate with his countrymen. Eventually, they got him up, and I saw Adam Adam Hadwin's wife Jessica on Twitter say that in classic Canadian fashion Adam actually apologized to the security guard for getting tackled so all of it was perfect the whole situation is roseworthy but I'll give it to Nick Taylor since he's the one that went out there and actually did the damn thing yeah I, I, I want to give Nick Taylor some credit because it was an amazing 72 footer punt but um, that broke uh, really beautifully but I got to give it to Hadwin uh, the way he held on to that Moet bottle, they said someone else said that was very Canadian for him not to spill the liquor even <laughs> while getting getting tackled. To to go out there and, and try to be a part of a moment. That security guard, the way he turned the corner, Mike, RIP to Kona Schwanky. It, it was like something I saw from like a, a, a DN just getting around the tackle and squaring up to to really zone in on the quarterback. Like it was it was it could be taught textbook. Tackles. Wasn't there a recent textbook tackle 
that we, well, were, no, we, that, we had the recent stiff arm that we got. Yes. Um, there it is. Uh, it, during, after one of the Stanley Cup final games, um, when Samantha Rivera gave the stiff arm to the fan in the Vegas Golden Knights crowd who was trying yeah. to get in her stand-up shot at the end. But, Brandon, this does absolutely join the teach tape of her, of Best Buy employees on Black Friday turning the Ooh. exit to the store into a yeah. mirror dodge drill and protecting it like offensive linemen. This form <laughs> tackle, because, again, he cleared trash, turned the yeah. hoop like we always hear for defensive ends, Saw what he hit. He kept his eyes up. He got his head to the side. He grabbed, grabbed through, grabbed cloth, kept driving his legs to the finish. Dro drove it was an Like, we're, Brandon, we're getting into minicamp territory. I would bet hard money that at least one NFL minicamp that's getting set to kick off this week is going yes. to display that footage in a team meeting. I would feel very comfortable, more comfortable even than laying down the money that Christian Brown won't end up in a national <laughs> ad by the end of this NBA Finals, that somebody is going to use that on their teach tape. It was that incredible of a moment. And everyone's all right on the other side, so we can feel good about it. But that's, you know, these security guards, Brandon, you do all this preparing. It's like being yeah. it's like being a scout team player. You do all this preparing, and then very rarely do you get to use what you've practiced and put it into play. This guy yeah. saw preparation meeting opportunity, and he said, "You know what? I'm going to err on the side of caution, and I am going to plant this mf'er right on the green." And I, you know, I hate bringing a brace, Mike. You know, I do, especially when it comes for a joke at the back end. But this, this is a black security guard, and. Uh, it may have been a moment of all y'all look alike to me because he didn't know if it was a streaker or, or someone trying to ruin the moment. He should have. I, I would think if it was a white security. All the other white security guards knew who, who Hedwig was. <laughs> Hedwin well, was. In, in, his, was, in his defense, too, again, and I, I want to give him back the two inches that he deserves, he's 5'8", a buck 65, but he had finished his round a little while ago and he had changed, so he was just in a pullover. He wasn't in yes. his golf attire and looking like he was in professional mode anymore, even though at any golf event you see a bunch of middle-aged dads all dressed like they're playing in the tournament anyway, so it's like, where's Waldo for everyone who's dressed like Waldo? I can yeah. understand a security guard erring on the side of caution, because sometimes all all of us do look the same when it comes to white people. I can I, I can yeah. be the one to say that for you and get us over the goal line. Brandon, was that who your rose was going to, by the way? Are you giving your rose to somebody else? I would have loved for it to go there, Mike, but you know I got to give it to this moment with Bernie. And apparently he wants some. Oh! Lucy! Bernie! Oh, yeah. Bernie get getting knocked out of the game. That was tough. Oh! If you guys, if you guys missed it, Conor McGregor is apparently selling some uh, spray for uh, after injuries, some cryo spray for you know. It's getting the right. same spray that the English soccer people have been using for injuries on the pitch for years. That we've wondered what it is. Is my guess. Re oh yeah, and it's it's called title. Um, but they so the Barney, the Miami Heat mascot, he's a, a anamorphic uh flame with a basketball nose and he came out there to to fight McGregor. McGregor knocks him out in what I uh, apparently was a part of the stunt because he got his block clean knocked off. But then McGregor, while he's on the ground in, in pure UFC fashion, hit him one good time and sent him to the hospital. After the baby Gronk thing, Mike, I don't know what's real or not, but uh shouts out to the mascot and Eric Spolstra said that's the type of uh heat toughness that we like to see. Yeah, heat culture definitely extends to the mascot, but not to the people who come up with the ideas for these stunts. Because whoever thought, oh, let's have the professional combat person go out here and execute a mock punch on our mascot, clearly forgets what these hands have been capable of. We saw it on full display there. Probably still not the most devastating moment for a mascot even in this series, since Rocky, the Nuggets mascot, famously got lowered from the rafters at a home <laughs> game and passed out on the way down. But it's pretty damn close. Brandon, speaking of beef between mascot and former member of the UFC, uh, I want to tell you about a little beef that we've got coming up here before we get to this, that, and the third. We've got Ooh. Father's Day beef. Not the kind between people, but the kind that can bring people together. The steak that your father wants to celebrate his day, Dad's Day, is coming up and it's approaching soon here. You're going to want to get this done now and make sure you take care of Dad. And you can do that 
with help from our friends at Omaha Steaks. For a limited time, when you go to omahasteaks.com and enter code GOJO right into the search bar, you're going to be able to order Dad's favorite gift package for just $99.99. Plus, you're going to get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers with the order. I have tried and sampled these burgers myself. They taste just like the steak on a bun. They are lean. They have a bold, great, beefy flavor. They're easy to cook and ready to go. This gift pack is awesome, by the way. Dad's going to love it. It comes with four bacon-wrapped fillets, four premium air chilled boneless chicken breasts four boneless pork chops four gourmet jumbo franks four made from scratch caramel apple tartlets for a little dessert for pops and some omaha steak seasoning plus those eight free omaha steaks burgers that we talked about for only 99.99 make this easy dads want steak and omaha steaks just isn't steak it's the best steak of your life guaranteed so don't wait go to omahasteaks.com type in gojo into the search bar and order dad's favorite gift package for father's day today that's omahasteaks.com keyword gojo again make sure you get right on that front take care of dad since he's taking care of you brandon let's get to this that and the third three quick stories to finish off the day here as always make sure you download subscribe rate review tell us what you want to hear more of on this show and let's start off the other sporting event over the weekend we talked about rbc we talked about basketball amanda nunez retired after beating the holy hell out of Irene aldana at ufc 289 over the weekend in vancouver british columbia the fight went all five rounds and branded it honestly seemed cruel because none of it was ever close amanda was whooping her whole ass the entire time in a way that seemed cruel and then ended by going over and you saw right after the fight end she ran over she talked to Dana White the president of the UFC and seemed to whisper something to him and then came into the ring where she was going to get interviewed by Daniel Cormier and announced that she was retiring now holding two title belts at the time of her retirement Juliana Pena was in the crowd she was supposed to be the one that Amanda Nunes was fighting in this fight the back end of their trilogy but had to pull out because she broke some ribs and so Irina Aldana was a late ad and it did not matter Amanda Nunes retires as unquestionably the greatest female fighter in UFC's history Brandon at 35 years old she has the most wins in UFC women's history with 16 the most UFC title fight wins among women in history with 11 she's tied for fourth most in UFC history regardless of gender with Anderson Silva and the most finishes in US women's history with 10 so she has beat the best out there Chris Cyborg Ronda Rousey Holly Holm She's got everything that you could have possibly accomplished in a UFC career, and it was incredible to watch the way that she finished it, which was complete and utter dominance. Yeah, she asked how how she wants to be remembered. She says the greatest of all time, and I think that's exactly how she wants to leave it. And the fact that she surprised everyone with the retirement proves just how focused she is on training and fighting. This was in the back of her mind the entire time, and yeah. she didn't touch the subject until she had, you know. Uh, poor Irene's face uh, uh, bloodied in, in, in the octagon. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just, I appreciate everything she's done uh, for, the, for, the, for the sport. And she put a lot of people on, including myself. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, an ambassador of this, but also, yeah, that mental part. Most of the time we hear in sports, once you've thought about retiring, you're retired. And the fact that she could walk into this sport, like we played a combat sport, Brandon, in football, but there's mm. still such a difference of walking into the ring and having it be one-on-one. And to have that knowledge in the back of your head that if this goes the way I want it to go, I am going to be done with this sport forever is an insane thing to comprehend where so much of what goes on between your ears is such a difference maker so congratulations to her on an incredible win and an even better career Brandon let's get to that uh Saquon Barkley was at a camp over the weekend it was his AMPT football camp and was talking about New York Giants mini camp that he will not be at as he has still not signed his franchise tag uh that the Giants have sent his way in March he's looking for that long-term deal and Brandon he has reiterated to Adam Schefter and others that he would like to be paid um basically amount compensating respectfully based on my contributions to the team on the field and in the locker room brandon he's made it clear he doesn't want a market setting deal he doesn't want to be the highest paid running back here but is also pushed back when those reports leaked out i'm sure from the giant side that they had offered him a deal worth about 14 million dollars a year with no instance or hinting of the guarantees involved so brandon i ultimately think this deal is going to get done before the july 17th deadline the franchise tag would pay saquon barkley 10 million 
million dollars this year. I think a little bit over that between 20, 10 and 12 million dollars a year over three years for a player that the offense was built around last year. Daniel Jones came yeah. along very well over the course of the season, but that offense ran through Saquon Barkley. I think with his age, the hope that the worst of his injury history is behind him and the chance to pay him not market setting money, but enough money to keep an incredibly talented player at the core of an offense that's building towards something would benefit both sides. Yeah, but I, I don't, I just feel like it's, it may be smarter for him to move on somewhere else. And I can't help but to look at the rest of the NFL and think, where would I like to see Saquon Barkley be the Saquon Barkley that we fell in love with? And I love to see him with the Bears. I know they're making a lot of crazy moves, um, and, and you know they have they have space, and they don't really have a, a, a star number one running back. But I think there's more fruit in shopping Saquon than getting a long term deal done with him in New York. Yeah, uh, and Saquon has also hinted and said that if the Giants don't come to the table with something he likes, that the possibility of sitting out the season like we saw Le'Veon Bell do years ago in Pittsburgh is something that's on the table. That's the best weapon that you have, again, as a player to try and make that happen. But I ultimately still think cooler heads are going to prevail. I just think Saquon seems a little bit too realistic about where the running back market is right now to be mm -hmm. a guy that pushes this past a point of no return. I think this is how negotiations go, and I think deadlines drive results and ultimately will in this situation. Brandon, let's get to the third, though. Um, last week on the show, we talked about the cheese at rest stop in Joshua Tree, California. They were taking over what was already a bit of a tourist spot landmark uh, out there and turning it into a brand activation because I am nothing if not someone addicted to late stage capitalism decided to drive out there <laughs> make a trip to Joshua Tree and go check out this activation Brandon I saw it was a giant cheese it gas nozzle that was shooting cheese it bags out into people's bags they had shirts available unfortunately not in my size by the time I got there that had wolves howling Travesty. at cheese it bags um, uh, Hawaiian shirts with cheese it stuff on it that you would have loved. Brandon, overall, I was amazed at just how much America... Like, this is deeply American. The whole thing felt very American because it was, oh, large brand mascot, potentially free stuff that I can get. Let's go check it out. There was a line of like 200 people there that did not diminish the entire time I was out there. It was amazing to see people show up and show out for snacks that they like. Mike, just like capitalism, oversell and underdeliver. Because uh, the headline says, <laughs> "Cheese it pump that fills cars with Cheez Its," and you're here to tell me they gave you how many Cheez Its at that pump? You got three bags of Cheez Its, which was great. And to be clear, I didn't expect they were going to fill the car with Cheez Its. Fill but, it. Uh... <laughs> Next time, next time around, we got to all read the fine print. So I went and did it so you didn't have to. We'll have plenty of pictures going up with this to let everyone get a peek under the hood of the cheese it experience out at Joshua Tree, which ultimately, again, uh, they're a brand, especially if you're a college football fan, that is basically woven into the fabric of your DNA, which is why I ended up there. Um, Mike, did you Brandon, meet someone? Brandon, as always. What? Did you meet someone? No. Maybe, I don't know, romantic interests at the cheese at snack place. I don't know. I'm trying to write your story. No, uh, unfortunately, like Natasha Bedingfield, the rest is still unwritten uh, on that front here. Uh, if you would like to write us a review, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review, leave us a five-star rating, and check us out on the DraftKings YouTube channel as well. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Boom, money in the bank.